Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome everyone to Ecology Live. This is our series of online talks from the British Ecological Society during this coronavirus work from home period. I'm Mark Cadott. I'm the chair of Applied Ecology Resources, which is a new online resource uh, and a journal, uh, Ecological Solutions and Evidence, published by the British Ecological Society. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. We hope you enjoy. And welcome back to all of our Ecology Live regulars. Uh, due to the success of the seminar series over the past few months, we are pleased to announce that we'll be continuing with a new set of speakers uh, throughout the summer, through July and August. And you can see all the details online. If you're enjoying these talks, and you want to find out more about the British Ecological Society or submit a paper to one of our seven journals, please do take the time to visit our website. Thanks as well to NHBS, who are sponsoring today's lecture. They supply equipment and books for ecologists and conservation professionals, and they have now extended their offer for free European shipping until the end of August for Ecology Live viewers. I'll show you some details at the end of today's talk. Shortly, I'll hand over to our speaker, Anusha Shankar, who's giving today's seminar. But first, let me explain the format. There'll be a short question answer period after the 25 minute talk. Please do submit your questions during the talk at any time using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Your questions can be named or they could be anonymous, you choose. I'll then pick a couple of questions to ask our speaker at the end of the session and we'll see how many we can get through. A note as well, we are recording the talk and we will post the video to YouTube afterwards. And Anusha has kindly agreed to answer any other questions uh, through Twitter or in the comment section of the YouTube video afterwards. Without waiting any longer, I'm happy to introduce today's speaker, Anusha Shankar from University of Alaska. She'll be introducing us how hummingbirds effectively spend their precious energy budgets. With that, take it away, Anusha. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, you can see me, right? Okay, um, so I'm gonna share my screen. <clears throat> Here we go. Okay. Um, thank you all so much for being here, and thank you to the BES for this opportunity to present some of my research. This is work that I did during my PhD on hummingbirds, um, and work that I will be continuing for another postdoc that I'm starting in August. Um, so let me introduce you to our study subjects first, hummingbirds. Um, they're incredible, they're extremely fast, as you can see here, they are tiny, they store very little energy and they use that energy very fast. So they're always living on this energetic kind of razor's edge between life and death. To give you a sense of how quickly they use energy, here's this uh, kind of schematic, which tells you how much energy a human would have to eat if they had the metabolic rate of different animals. So an average Matt Damon, who's like 84 kilograms, would have to eat about 15 packets of Lay's chips a day, or crisps, as you say in the UK, um, in order to survive every day. If he had the metabolic rate of an elephant, but the same size as a human, he would have to eat about four packets of Lay's chips a day. And if he had the metabolic rate of a hummingbird, he would need to eat 600 packets of Lay's chips a day. So they're using energy super, super quickly. And they get this energy from really high uh, energy nectar or sugar water from plants that uh, are distributed in their habitats. And they're able to live in a wide variety of habitats from the cloud forests in, um, the, in South America that you can see on the left, deserts in Arizona that you can see on the top right, and the high elevation Andes all over South America. They also come up further north all the way to um, Alaska sometimes in the summer. And they have a wide distribution of body sizes, colors, bill lengths. Um, they're just incredible in their diversity. There's over 330 species of hummingbirds. So you can see this uh, tiny little bee hummingbird up in the middle. 
and then the giant hummingbird down on the right, the swordbill hummingbird on the top right, um, and they're all uh, distributed all over North and South America. So first, let's look at this size distribution and what it means, um, and explore this idea of uh, the hummingbird paradox. It is kind of strange that there's so many species and that they all survive in all of these different habitats. Um, and to look at this, let's look at allometry. I'll give you a, a tiny little intro for those of you who aren't familiar with that term. So this is a graph of uh, energy expenditure on the y-axis over here and mass on the x-axis. And these are both on a log-log scale. The uh, allometry is the study of the relationship between some parameter and usually body mass. So you could look at brain size and how that changes with mass or um, medicine dosage. So initially it started to be used because veterinarians wanted to know how much to dose a horse if they already knew how much to dose dose a dog with a medicine, for example. And how much do you dose an elephant? You um, can use allometric relationships to figure that out rather than just guess and kill things. Um, so if you have an allometric slope of one, that means that per unit of increase in body mass, you have an, a unit increase in energy expenditure. If you have a slope slightly less than one, that means that bigger animals use slightly less energy per unit of their body mass than smaller animals. So here lizards have a slightly lower allometric slope than one. Mammals have an even lower allometric slope and birds have a much lower allometric slope. So a bigger bird uses much less energy per unit of its body mass than a smaller bird. But scaling also depends on what you're spending energy on. So according to this metabolic level boundaries hypothesis proposed in the early 2000s, um, it depends whether you're spending energy on muscle activity and high power things, in which case your scaling uh, slope is closer to one. Whereas if you're spending energy on thermoregulating, on maintaining your body's high body temperature or regulating your, the water flux of your body, then your slope is closer to 6.67 because it's related to the surface area of your body rather than the volume. And this is within a taxon. Okay, hummingbirds are birds, so they should have a slope of 0.67, right? Mm. Previously on hummingbird allometry in the 1900s, it was found from this uh, review kind of study that their allometric slope is 1.21. And that's insanely high. That's not at all what we'd expect any animal to have. As you can see, hummingbirds have this 1.21 here compared to all the other animals which are below one. Uh, having a slope of more than one means that a larger animal is much more inefficient in using energy than a smaller animal which means that this giant hummingbird is way worse in its efficiency of using energy than the tiny little bee hummingbird on the left. And this doesn't make any sense according to the laws of like economics and physics because as you get larger and scale things up, like if you're a factory owner who wants to scale things up, you want your unit costs to go down. You wanna be more and more efficient as you scale things up. And so this larger bird, it got scaled up, but it became worse and worse and worse at using energy which is really strange. So we wanted to explore this relationship a little bit further and see this was based on relatively few species on, in very few um, groups of hummingbirds. And so we wanted to see whether it held true for a wider variety of species and a greater distributional range as well. So we went to Arizona um, to these beautiful deserts where they feed on the little red flowers you can see in the foreground and to Ecuador um, partly in these cloud forests, which are beautiful and blanketed with clouds every evening, and also to the high elevation Andes. And we used a method called doubly labeled water to study the daily energy expenditure of these animals. So we wanted to know how much energy they use in 24 hours. And one way of doing this, I'm gonna be really brief, and you can ask me more questions about this method later, but we basically give them a double isotopic form of water. We either feed it to them or inject it into their uh, pectoral muscle. And um, we collect a pea sample and let them go. And 24 hours later, we try to get another pea sample. And in that time, they've been breathing out carbon dioxide. Now, the difference between the isotopic concentrations of the hydrogen and the oxygen tell us how much carbon dioxide they've breathed out. And how much carbon dioxide you've breathed out is a great measure for energy expenditure. So we know how much energy they've spent in the wild in 24 hours by using this measure. And we did that for a bunch of species, and we also included the literature values 
to get this allometric um, equation. So the bigger circles are the species means, and the smaller circles are the individual values that we got per species. And this is, as earlier, a log of the energy expenditure per day um, versus the log of the mass. And we found that they have a slope of 0 0.96. 0 0.96 is slightly less than one. So they're not really being as inefficient as they get larger as we thought, um, but they still have a really unusually high slope. So it's like they have a slope that's closer to lizards than it is to birds. And that's really strange still. So why is that? What are they spending energy on that makes it so unusual how they scale their energy compared to other birds? Remember that I told you about this metabolic level boundaries hypothesis and that if you're scaling closer to one, it means that you're spending energy on more power related processes. Hummingbirds can use this incredible strategy called torpor, which is kind of like hibernation every night um, if they want. And it, it's a strategy where they can save a bunch of energy by kind of shutting off all of their metabolic functions and just keeping the very, very bare minimum going. So they're spending only like 15% of the energy that they normally use in the day when they're in torpor. Um, and it turns out the top first scales with, an X, with a slope close to one. Whereas if they're spending energy on heat and water flux, it's closer to 0.67. So maybe that allometric slope is affected by what they're spending energy on during the day. And maybe that, that kind of energy expenditure is different from what other birds have. So let's dig into that a little bit further. We've verified that they do have an unusually high slope compared to other birds, but it isn't like defying the laws of physics. Um, next, we look at whether daily energy expenditure is fixed or variable. So can an individual or a species or a population change its daily energy requirements um, in response to what's happening around it? And what is it spending its energy on? Is it spending energy on activity, on high power muscle things like hovering, or is it spending its energy more on thermoregulating and water flux? So to look at this, um, let's take an analogy. Imagine that the beaker uh, here is daily energy expenditure. And the size of the beaker tells you how much energy the bird is spending in 24 hours. So if it's smaller, the bird is spending a very little energy, and if it's large, the bird is spending more. We uh, use this broad-billed hummingbird that you see on the screen as, as, as a model species to study this energy budget variation. And we did this at two sites. One is in Arizona. Uh, both are in Arizona, sorry. They're only about eight kilometers apart from each other. One is Hasha Creek which is elevationally and vegetationally very diverse. So it has a lot of shady spots like you, you can see on the right for field assistance and hummingbirds to take a little break from the heat. Um, so there's a lot of microclimate variation. And the other side is Sonoita Creek, which is much more flat, much, much uh, less vegetationally diverse and much hotter on average. So here you can see Hasha Creek on the left, Sonoita Creek on the right. And um, these are the temperature distributions with uh, gray being Hasha and red being Sonoita. And you can see both during the night and during the day, Sonoita is shifted to the right. So it's warmer and hotter than um, Hasha Creek is. So we really thought that maybe these microclimate differences and temperature thermoregulation could play a difference um, in these different sites. We also managed to capture birds both before the monsoon and in the early monsoon. So we could see whether um, temperature and resource availability or flower availability in their sites affected their daily energy expenditure. And we could kind of separate these components. So um, I'm gonna show you our results for the daily energy expenditure. Um, this is similar to the other graph that you saw with daily energy expenditure on the Y axis, but here we have site and monsoon season on the X axis. And you'll be seeing these um, like earlier harshas on the left and sonatas on the right and it's pre-monsoon and then early monsoon. So these box plots show you the whole, the variation in daily energy expenditure overall. The dots are individual points for daily energy expenditure. The colored dots are individuals that we recaptured both pre-monsoon and early monsoon. So you can see that if you just look at this, the box plots are different from each other, right? Each box is different. Um, and Sonoita Creek early monsoon, especially the one on this far right, is way higher than all, all of the other groups and it doesn't overlap with either of the pre-monsoon groups. And the individual points, the colored points, tell us that not only was, it, was this change at the population level, it was at the individual level as well. Individuals could change how much energy they spent. So it wasn't like some individuals were always low energy expenditure and some were high. 
um, some of them were able to change as well. And some didn't, as you can see with the red. Um, so what could explain this huge variation in daily energy expenditure? We know now that daily energy expenditure can change, so it can be really small and it can get really big to twice the amount that, uh, of the smallest beaker. Um, so they can drastically change how much energy they spend in a day, but where is that change coming from? So it is variable. Now let's look at their daytime activity. Now I have tracked my own time and I spend about 5% of my day on daily exercise. Um, and then exactly 33% of my day on sleep, which is a solid eight hours. It's really healthy for all human beings. And I wonder what uh, hummingbirds are spending their energy on. So let's look inside that beaker to see what kind of fills it up. Um, how much of it goes to hovering, how much of it goes to flying and to using torpor or not. Um, so as a side note, so as a, a kind of a theoretical framework for this, you can have a fixed daily energy expenditure and if you increase your basal metabolic rate or basic maintenance costs, you have to decrease everything else because you uh, fed on a limited amount of energy and you don't have much energy stored. And so you have to allocate within what you have available. The independent model of uh, energy expenditure is that if you increase your basal metabolic rate, you could increase or decrease the other components. It doesn't really mean that they have to be allocated in a fixed way. So daily energy expenditure can change. The third model is the performance model where a, an increase in basal metabolic rates facilitates an increase in all the other things. So your basic body is like kind of stronger and more capable and your energetic basal energetic rate is higher. So you're able to do more things. So we've already seen that the hummingbirds don't fit into this allocation model on the left because their daily energy expenditure can change. So they must be one of the other two. To construct this energy budget then and see how these things pass out, we can look at daily energy expenditure on the left of this equation and basal metabolic rate, thermoregulatory costs, activity costs like hovering, flying and perching and nighttime energy costs on the right. So if we measure all these things separately and add them up, they should equal what we found with the doubly labeled water on the left, daily energy expenditure. And that way we can fill that beaker up. So the daily energy expenditure is a function of the time that they're spending on something and the energy that they're spending on something. It's really, we, we can measure the energy that they're spending on something, but how much time are they spending on things? We could put a Fitbit if they were like human sized, but they would really fall off on a hummingbird because they're so small and we don't have accelerometers small enough for, to study them. Which measures the oxygen and carbon dioxide in their breath to get an estimate of energy expenditure. And so we can fill in all these components except the time that they're spending on different activities during the day. So because we have all the other components of this equation, including the energy per unit time um, and the overall nighttime energy expenditure, we can kind of model how much time they're spending on all the activities. So this is the same graph as earlier, except I'm gonna add the model points on. And the model points tell you these different activity budgets. So I model a really low activity budget, which was 5% hovering, 20% uh, flying, 75% perching, which is the top green one and 15, 15, 70, which is the next one. These two are what the literature said hummingbirds do. So most of the literature in the past has found that they spend most of their time perching um, and not much time hovering and flying. So we also model some really high activity budgets like 40% hovering, 40% flying, and 20% perching. And we found that the Sonoita Creek early monsoon, this rightmost one, the only the really, really high activity budget could explain it. So they were spending like 80% of the day flying around um, and only 20% perching. So they're capable of much wider variation than we thought they were. I also allowed that per unit energy cost to vary and allowed for individual variation. And still that really, really high activity budget is the only one that can explain Sonoita in the early monsoon. So activity costs out of the, the different categories, activity, nighttime energy, and thermoregulation and BMR, activity costs are the highest and the most variable of the three um, in their contribution to the overall energy budget. But why is that? What was happening around them that made them change their activity costs and made them increase their daily energy expenditure so much in the early monsoon? It turns out that the resources, especially pre-monsoon, were really clumped and abundant. And as the early monsoon set in, the resources actually took a dip. So there were fewer resources and they were scattered. 
So hummingbirds had to spend more and more energy hovering and flying and finding those resources, increasing their overall daily energy expenditure. So I spend about 5% of my day active, which is like less than an hour a day, and they spend three to 13 hours of their day flying around and hovering. And they're super, super high energy um, birds. They're capable of being. And so we think that this independent model fits the best because it didn't seem like there was a correlation between basal metabolic rate and all the other behaviors. Um, so daily energy expenditure is variable and daytime activity is not mostly perching. But let's see how this can inform our understanding of that allometric relationship. We thought of using a new way to, to put these two things together. Usually allometry is like, is studied very differently, but we thought why not add up the energy budget components slopes with mass across species and see if those match the daily energy expenditure. So we're using that individual level energy budget um, approach to studying allometry. So DE is a sum of all those things. We modified it a little bit and added perching, hovering, and flying metabolic rate slopes instead of the activity um, component. And so we got a bunch of slopes. I'll skip through this quickly, but basically they have high basal metabolic rates. Uh, the range is pretty wide, but they have high basal metabolic rates but really high hovering and flying uh, slopes. And also torpor, as you can see on the bottom. So it turned out that our measured DE slope from doubly labeled water was 0.96, if you remember from earlier. And our added energy budget slopes were also 0.96, which is incredible. So you can add up the, the slopes of the different components of the energy budget. This is disregarding time. It doesn't matter how much time they spend on things, it's how much energy they spend per unit time. And they all add up to DEE. -E. Um, so allometry, they do have an unusually high slope, and this is largely explained by their high basal metabolic rates and um, slopes and activity slopes. Daily energy expenditure is super variable for hummingbirds, and daytime activity is not mostly perching. It's highly variable depending on what their resources are. They're capable of very high activity levels, and they seem to really respond to what's happening in their environment, in this case, floral availability. And they seem to be able to switch from being energy loss minimizers, just sitting there and eating and not spending energy, to being energy gain maximizers, flying large distances to get more energy. And it's important to know these things because they're important pollinators. Um, so if their uh, plants are, are dying out and they die out, and if they die out, the plants will die out. So there's a big mutualistic relationship here. I will end by talking to you about these larger scale implications. They have really flexible energy budgets, which is really good to know. Um, I wonder how many other species we can get these kinds of energy budgets for and how flexible they are across space and time. Hummingbirds seem to have really fine scale energetic control over uh, what they're spending energy on in their day. And for now, they seem adaptable to environmental change. Um, they see, but I don't know what the longer term consequences of that are. So if your resources are really scarce, that was in the early monsoon for a few weeks. If that goes on and on for many months, I don't know if they have to give up reproduction, for example, as, um, because they have to fly so much and hover so much. Also, basal metabolic rates are often used as a proxy for daily energy expenditure. And in our case, they definitely don't correlate with each other very well. So I don't know if basal metabolic rates and these global analyses of energy uh, in animals are good proxies for daily energy expenditure. With that, I'm so excited to take, I hope not more than two minutes of your questions. Um, I'd like to thank all of these people, my co-authors and my funding sources. And um, as Mark said earlier, you can find me on Twitter here if you don't get to ask your question now. Mark? Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, Anusha, that was that was great, and uh, I have to say I'm I'm, I'm quite envious. You work with such uh, uh, beautiful animals, and you seem to work in, in lovely places as well. Uh, that was really great. Uh, so we have we we do have some questions that have come in, and um, and uh, uh, some interesting ones. Um, uh, so I'm going to start with this one. Um, person is, is anonymous, but they did say hello, Anusha. The study is really cool. Um, which a couple of the, uh, a number of the questions have started off with uh, thinking your talk and your subject Thank you. is great. Um, so this person wants to know whether or not um, uh, some aspects of, of development like maternal investment and offspring uh, uh, 
has an important influence in uh, energy budgets or how maybe behaviorally how they can they can uh, adapt and, and alter their energy budgets? That's a really good question and we didn't study it at all. Um, like a lot of work in ecology and in biomedical sciences, for example, we ignored the females. Um, and I hate this idea in general, but I think we have to start from the most simple, um, which end up being the males because they um, the females have sole care of the offspring and they lay the eggs and they take care of them until they're fledged. And so the males don't have any of those costs. They only have to fight with each other and mate with the females. Um, so we only studied males for this study. Um, it would be nice. I have a collaborator who, and we, we just submitted a paper about um, whether females use torpor at night or not. And so he also has some activity um, data for them during the day. So that would be nice to get to next. Uh, you, yeah, so you preempted a, a other questions about uh, 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 sex differences. Um, so uh, th there are some questions about um, the role of, uh, so I'm going to summarize these questions together. Yeah. Uh, so you showed show a map, uh, so it's a global distribution, and we know that these the hummingbirds uh, vary in size substantially, live in different places. What is the role of, of climate in um, and not only the size, but how, mu how much uh, you know, mm. energetically uh, are they restricted to certain types of climates? If we're going to go to a certain type of climate, are we going to see individuals of a certain size? Or uh, how, do, how does climate play into this? I usually get asked that question by journalists who are like, but will climate change affect them? Um, and it's a really, really complicated question to answer. This one, I think, is maybe easier. So they're distributed in North and South America, and they're, they have an interesting evolutionary history. They move their ancestor was in Germany, and then they moved through North America down to South America, and then diversified and then moved back up into North America. And of these 330 species, I think there's a good distribution of size, but only one is that giant hummingbird, the 20 gram one. Everything else is between just 1.8 grams and 12 grams or some or so. Um, and they're distributed pretty evenly across elevations and temperatures. They um, are more abundant in South America and then they migrate up to breed in the summer to North America and then go back down. Um, and there's a few that are resident year round in, on the west coast of the US and in Mexico. Um, I, I, there have been studies on their size and how that changes with uh, temperature and I, I, I don't think there's very strong trends. Um, I think they do get larger as they go up elevation maybe. Um, yeah. So maybe related to that, a couple of questions have come in, and um, uh, the most recent one by Maria Magdalena Ramirez Martinez, and she says regards from Mexico. Um, but uh, a couple of people have asked or indicated uh, about the role that migration might play. So you know, we sort of get the sense that hummingbirds are on the edge energetically because of their energetic demands and uh, and maybe limited uh, resource availability. What about having to save up and store and for some, for some future event. How does, how does uh, migratory species play into this? Yeah, it's fascinating what they're capable of doing. So um, all of these ones that I presented to you are, um, I studied them in the non-migratory season, again, trying to strip away all the complications. Um, but migratory birds tend to fatten up before they migrate. And so they completely switch how they use their energy. And they use torpor, for example, even, even while they're trying to get fatter. Because usually you use torpor only when your energy reserves are low and you're trying to save energy at night. Mm -hmm. um, but when they're migrating, they, like the ruby-throated hummingbird that's on the east coast of the U.S., it doubles its weight. It goes from three grams to six grams, and it still keeps using torpor every night, I think. Um, so that I think it's, a, it's like a switch that's flipped, and they're like, oh, I have to migrate now. Let me fatten up and let me maximize my energy savings so that I can make it a, like across the Gulf of Mexico, which is an incredible distance to migrate um, for a tiny little bird. Yeah. Oh, that's a really interesting topic. I think that's the, the time we have where we've gotten to uh, half past. Um, and so I want to thank you again for a, a really great talk. And, uh, and I can see from the questions, a lot of people are really fascinated and interested in this topic. So thank you again. Thank you, Mark. Um, and I'll just end off with a couple of slides after I share my screen. Okay, so um, that brings today's Ecology Live to a close. And thanks again to Anusha uh, for a, a really great uh, and interesting talk. And thank you, uh, everyone.
the hundreds of you out there for uh, tuning in today and listening to this talk. Uh, and, uh, and just to reiterate, um, you can engage with Anusha on uh, Twitter, uh, as well as this talk will appear on uh, YouTube. And there's a comment section there as well that uh, questions can be asked and answered. Uh, next week at the same time, uh, we'll have Bill Sutherland from the University of Cambridge, who will be addressing the question, um, how can we make ecology and conservation more professional? And just to end off, I want to leave you the details of the offer, offer from the sponsors of today's Ecology Live Talk and HBS. Thank you again for tuning in and see you next Thursday.